There is this nasty virus that's going around. It's called CryptoLocker. And we've been seeing a growing amount of this uh, making its way around the Internet. And so I've asked our good friend Adam Kajawa from Malwarebytes to join us on the show. And thankfully, able to be here tonight. Adam, it's so good to see you. Thanks for joining us at Category 5. No problem. Glad to be here. So we're going to talk a little bit tonight, Adam, about this crypto locker, locker virus and uh, what it means to the viewers. Uh, I think what it boils down to is that this is probably one of the most destructive viruses that we've seen in a very, very long time. Perhaps you could shed some light on uh, what is so, I guess, frightening to the end users when it comes to crypto locker. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> sure thing. So a lot of people have probably heard of uh, what we call ransomware, which is just uh, malware that... Uh, the FBI ransomware is the biggest one. Um, it locks down the desktop and makes it impossible for the user to access their uh, files or even the start menu. Uh, and they end up having to you know, remove it by safe, going into safe mode or, or various other uh, methods. Um, CryptoLocker is different in that it doesn't necessarily lock out the desktop. Instead, it encrypts the, all the personal files of the user, which means their, their documents, their images, things like that. Um, it encrypts it uh, dually with, with two different types of encryption. Um, first, locally, uh, encryption with a key that it creates then and there with AES encryption. And then it pulls down a key that's randomly generated from a command and control server oh. and encrypts what is already encrypted with RSA encryption. Um, without that particular key uh, that's only located on the remote command and control server, it's virtually impossible to get your files back. So now viewers think, okay, well, encryption, that's a good thing, right? You'd think so. So consider that here's a virus that, in fact, encrypts your data with encryption that you cannot decrypt. So mm -hmm. there's this big problem, Adam, and that is that when your computer becomes infected with this crypto locker uh, malware, virus, whatever you want to call it, I would call it a virus at this point with the way that it's behaving, um, the antivirus products, even the, the highest, you know, the best and well-graded antivirus products, they'll remove CryptoLocker, but the problem is is that it's too late. All of your files are now lost. And so yeah. that's where this, you know, it becomes one of the most devastating viruses that, uh, that we've seen in a long time. Is there anything we can do when our files have been lost to CryptoLocker? Um, well, no one ever advises to pay the fine. No one in the computer security uh, community will advise to pay the fine that CryptoLocker charges the users in order to get their files back um, for multiple reasons. One, you don't want to you know, feed the beast. Yeah. And the other reason is that uh, it's not a guarantee that you get your files back. In fact, CryptoLocker has uh, a timer on it. If you don't pay within, I think it's 48 hours, um, the fine, then the key to unencrypt your files is deleted. And so it's gone forever. And there's no way possibly to get them back. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, we'll talk a little bit about what we need to do to prevent data loss in event that we get infected. And, and people will think, okay, well, I, you know, I run Linux or whatever, but fact is most people have one or two Windows computers, especially if you're on a business network. And that's something that's really frightening is that CryptoLocker will actually go out spidering through mapped network shares and actually encrypt network shares on your network. So companies who have, for example, a single folder shared to all of the computers, right. you know, they may all have what they call their P drive or their Q drive or whatever, and that's yeah. where everybody drops their company documents and Excel spreadsheets mm -hmm. and they share those files. One of those computers on the network gets infected and suddenly nobody has access to those files. They're completely gone. There's no way to get them back. Exactly. Right. That's scary. a really real <laughs> threat. That's very, very scary stuff. So I'm careful. Mm -hmm. I've got the latest antivirus app. How could I get CryptoLocker? Uh, CryptoLocker is, is uh, distributed via exploits, uh, drive-by exploits, um, mainly, as in most malware these days is. So are we talking uh, uh, infected files or an infected website? As an infected website that you might visit if you're not using an up-to-date uh, version of, a, of a, a Java or Flash or something like that. I see. Or even one that just has a vulnerability in it, um, the site can, the page can exploit your browser or yeah. that particular application like Java. Is, and, say, uh, is, say, Chrome control. or Firefox safer than Internet Explorer? 
it's really a toss in the air. I personally say I like to use Chrome. Mm-hmm. Um, Firefox has had its own bugs, and Internet Explorer has always has come a long way, uh, and it's much more secure than it used to be. But I still recommend using something like Chrome. Okay. But it really comes down to just the extensions you use uh, and the add-ons and things like that. If Java is installed for your browser, regardless of the browser, right. and it's in an older version, it may be susceptible to an exploit. Mm, now, do we need to okay. in- remove Java? Do we need to remove? I disable. I mean, you, you have you have Java running on your operating system. Uh, for instance, if anyone to plays Minecraft, uh, you would have to run Java to play Minecraft. Well, that's on your operating system. Um, inside your browser is an extension to use Java, and that can be disabled. In fact, Firefox usually disables it automatically. Okay, um, so we can disable the extension it. rather than the actual program. Can when there's a known vulnerability and there's no patch for it, uh, hmm. it's, it's, it's best to just disable it entirely. And honestly, you don't need it all the time. Got it. Um, if there's a specific occasion when you might need Java on in your browser, you can re-enable it to use it. Uh, otherwise, you can look at YouTube or, or do whatever you want. You don't have to worry about it. Right. Gotcha. Okay. Um, well, as many of you know, we're a Linux-based um, kind of show here, so I know all our Linux viewers are curious to know if they're safe, but then there's lots of other platforms as well out there. For example, I'm a, I'm a Mac user primarily, so Linux users, Mac users, anyone else, are we safe? Are we not? Right now you are. Okay. <laughs> right now. It's just a matter of time. Um, as we've seen over the last few years, uh, Apple products, Apple operating systems have been targeted a lot more. Sure, mm-hmm. yeah. And, you know, it's it's almost, it's just not much of a target as it was. I mean, it, it's become much more of a target that people use Apple products or, or even Linux products. And we've seen Linux malware, we've seen Apple malware, um, and just a matter of time before this style of malware makes it over. But CryptoLocker itself is a Windows-only problem at this point? For now, yes. Yes. I see. Okay. Uh, in general, what can we do to protect ourselves against uh, this type of thing? Is there something that we can, you know, obviously you're with malware bytes, and, and you know, I, I use um, various antivirus from ESET, um, and the fact is, is no matter what antivirus you're running, it's, it's still able to get through, which is a very, very scary thing. And as I was mentioning at the beginning of this interview, it will detect and remove the virus, but by then it's too late because your mm-hmm. files are already encrypted. I'm not a viral programmer, so I don't know how that's even possible, but it's it's very, very scary. So what can users do, and is there something that you're doing with malware bytes that uh, is more effective than, say, just our, our antivirus in and of itself? Well, there's two main methods of protecting yourself from something like CryptoLocker. Um, the first is using an antivirus, any malware uh, type tool, uh, one that, that uses a, a proactive approach and then it prevents execution of the malware to begin with. Yeah. Uh, or even we have a product, uh, our bytes and exploit. Um, other AVs have similar products that block exploits from even executing on their system. I see. Um, which is a great way to stop it. However, new variants are made all the time of different kinds of malware, especially something like CryptoLocker. So while today all the AVs might protect against one variant, tomorrow they may not protect against that one. Yeah. So the best thing to do, honestly, uh, to stay safe from this particular threat is to use backups. Um, backing up to something on a network is obviously not a good idea, yeah. but using something like backing up to, to a cloud service or uh, even just using System Restore for Windows um, is, a, is a great way to keep your files safe. And uh, and you may not get the, the most recent version depending on when your backup is, Sure. but you can still get them back regardless. You know, that's a a very honest answer, and I I greatly appreciate that on behalf of our viewers. Um, Back up and back up your backups, I think, is is really the only way that you can really protect yourself from this. Um, I I actually, you mentioned about Windows Restore, and it's one of those things that, you know, sometimes we turn that off because uh, it takes up space on our hard drive. But I did find that CryptoLocker was unable to touch volume shadow copies, which is an exciting thing because Windows 7 out of the box is going to have a volume shadow copy enabled for what? Your documents folder. And because of that, if your documents get corrupted in the documents folder, you can, in fact, revert to a previous timestamp by right-clicking on the folder, going properties, going into previous versions, and you'd actually be able to recover those files after you've used your antivirus product to remove the the infection. So that is effective, but where that goes wrong is, like you say, what if 
you your volume shadow copy is out of date or what if you know you're running low on hard drive space and so windows allocates very little to your volume shadow copy and you've got a massive documents folder then that's a big problem so uh, yeah. cloud backups definitely mm-hmm. offsite backup some of the offsite backup solutions and I'll put some links in the show notes for episode number 317 uh, but they'll actually offer incremental backups which means mm-hmm. you can choose a date before the infection took place and actually mm-hmm. revert your files which is a fantastic way to do it so Marobytes has a secure, a secure backup solution as well uh, but oh, anyone work as long as it, it takes them off of your system and yep. stores them somewhere secure but like I said doing it on the network even having a, a remote or a, a USB drive to back all your files yep. up on if it's still plugged in it's susceptible to being it's gone infected. And we think yeah. we've tried to reiterate to our viewers as well, Adam, that a RAID 1 architecture, for example, as a backup solution is not actually a backup solution. It's, it's a fail-safe against a failed hard drive. Yeah. But CryptoLocker is a real wake-up call to us in that if you get this infection, both of your drives are corrupt. You have no mm-hmm. access to either of your RAID 1 drive mm-hmm. because the files are gone. They're, they're destroyed. You have no way to decrypt them. So, um, And also, you know, there are situations where people are taking a drive and backing up once a night kind of thing and taking it off-site, which sounds like a good plan, but I've seen it happen where, so then, you know, the infection takes place 5 o'clock the night before, manager comes in the following morning, plugs in yesterday's backup drive, and it overwrites it with all corrupt data. So uh, yeah. then again, you end up with absolutely nothing. So... It's got to be something that cannot be touched. And as Adam is saying, cloud backup solutions these days are fantastic. Mm-hmm. And uh, as long as it is read-only as far as, you know, can the virus access it? Right. No. So Dropbox, Pogo Plug, all those things are fantastic. But if they're mounted as a m- mounted network share on your computer, say, you know, Pogo Plug ma- gives you a P drive. Well, guess oh. what? Your P drive is now wiped and destroyed, and all the data that's on it is destroyed. That's a very real threat. So, does malware bytes? What's that? Might have to dust off your old zip drives. I think so. that's a scary thought. Boy, oh boy. <laughs> I think oh. they're about time for a comeback. I'm just yeah. saying. I like the zip drive. <laughs> Love floppies and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and that's the other thing, too. I mean, thinking about zip drives and, and, you know, tapes, tape backups and things, it's very time consuming to recover a large backup. If you're working on a network that is, you know, a large scale business, mm-hmm. uh, even a small to medium business, it can take a lot of time and it can result in a lot of downtime and a lot of loss access to files if this infection takes place because the backups take a long time to transfer over and, and to restore. So that's another thing. Does Malwarebytes currently protect against this iteration of CryptoLocker? It, uh, our pro version does. Okay. And, and that's because it has a proactive, it, it, it prevents malware from execution. Our free version is just a scanner and won't do any good. I mean, it'll remove the pickle locker virus and the malware. Yeah, I hear. It's encrypted everything, um, but we don't we don't practically protect unless it's with our pro version. I see. So we're looking at the difference between you know uh, malware bites the free version as being able to recover from you know any other kind of malware that just yeah. is, is removable and then you're back to operation. But here's a situation where it's it's your files are gone if you don't have exactly. proactive protection. It's completely That's, unique. It's scary stuff. So. Mm-hmm. Basically, you know, this is a big threat, and I wanted to take time tonight to discuss it um, for the sake of our viewers, especially those who are still using Windows mm-hmm. on some of the machines. You know, the question will come up, is this a threat to virtual machines? And I'll let you tackle that. And, you know, what, what's the scenario as far as, you know, virtual networks? And people are using Linux as the host and, and Windows as a guest. For those who are not quite understanding what that means, what is the threat to those users? Uh, well, I mean, if they're using a Windows system and a VM, uh, presuming that and and they get infected with CryptoLocker, um, presuming that they don't they don't have a, a shared drive that's just constantly open to the VM, um, they should be okay. But if that shared drive, even if it's on a Linux system, is connected to the Windows system mm-hmm. in the VM, and uh, CryptoLocker can get to to those files and and encrypt them, so. I mean, it's really just about what, what files are stored where, and if it's running, all it needs is, is Windows to run as the operating system. Well, that makes 
reasons. So we're talking um, if if a user has like a network attached storage or a NAS drive on their network somewhere that has Samba sharing to their virtual machine, then the virtual machine can become a conduit for this crypto locker to. Or actually. even if you use something like VMware and just use a shared drive, I mean, sure. you can easily set it up to have it so that your the host uh, drive even your home your home uh, folder in mm-hmm. Linux is connected to your VM through mm-hmm. the shared drive that's always open. Um, and if you get that those crypto locker to the Windows, it has access to that shared drive in that home folder. So if you have any documents or images in there, it can still uh, encrypt them. It's it's however a- however Linux doesn't always like to use file extensions, so it might it might be safe. <laughs> it depends, I guess. Hey, this thing yeah. will corrupt ODT files and you know Excel, uh, uh, you know all the LibreOffice spreadsheets, everything. So yeah, it's it's. Scary stuff. So if you have any kind of network shares, then you got to be wary of this. So, yeah, if you're using a, a, a VM to do any sort of, you know, sketchy searching around on the internet, you know, doing sure. things, that, going places that you don't necessarily trust, that you should not keep a shared drive mm-hmm. connected to it, or even have it connected to a, you know, unsecured network. Yeah, we're going to see this coming through infected websites. Do these have to be malicious sites? I mean, people f- sometimes say, oh, well, you've got this infection. You've obviously been surfing for pornography or something like it's that. It's not always the case. There's, there's uh, types of, of infections, uh, vectors out there. Um, one is called malvertisements. Mm-hmm. Uh, basically, it's just a uh, bad guy has hijacked uh, the ad service for any sort of legitimate site. And as the ad, as the, as the site loads, yep. uh, ads from the ad service, it could be inadvertently redirecting or executing malicious code on the Yikes. system. Okay. So it could be any site, really, that's out there. And yeah. it's, uh, it's kind of up to the system administrators of those sites to keep them up to date and make sure that there aren't the exploits. And that's one of the reasons that we got away from um, you know bulk source code that's available everywhere, because that's so easily exploited. And suddenly yeah. you've got you know all this kind of malware happening through your own website. Mm-hmm. So. Um, that's a whole other topic altogether, but it has to be taken seriously, folks. This is a really, really big threat, and uh, it is going around. A- Adam, what kind of um, scale are we talking about as far as the the largeness of the infection radius? It's, you it's growing, yeah. and and this particular malware is just a start. I mean, it, it's honestly, it was easy enough for them to create this then it's just a matter of time before the source code for either this malware or other uh, styles come out. And Mm -hmm. then we start seeing variants all over the place do the same thing. It's obviously affecting Windows 7, Windows 8, um, so it's not something that, you know, it's not specific to older computers or anything like that. Um, Do we think that we're more susceptible with, say, XP that is going to be losing support in April? Oh, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Uh, XP is, is going to, we're going to lose support for it. Yeah. Um, the biggest problem is that the third party applications that run, you know, like, like Java and Explorer, they all use older versions on something like XP. Yeah. So those are more susceptible to infection as well as XP itself. Um, but yeah, I mean, any operating system, and if it isn't yet, it will be. Yeah. Okay. So if you're running Windows XP, be warned that uh, it is going to be basically expiring come April. And when that happens, there is not going to be any security support. So it's almost as, you know, you wonder if there are hackers lying in wait with a whole bunch of new malware just waiting to... For their opportunity. They're just waiting. A lot of them have actually already switched over to 7 or 8. They're looking for the bigger targets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, Uh, There's less and less users every day of of Windows XP. Everyone everyone listening to this is probably telling all their friends and family, why are you still using XP? Where can we find you? Where can we find uh, more information about, about... you know, basic security uh, essentials and, and all the stuff that we need to know? Well, our website is malwarebytes.org, and we actually have a blog that we post on multiple times a week. Um, all of our security experts do, and then some. Uh, it's blog.malwarebytes.org. Nice and easy. Very mm-hmm. good. Okay, Adam, And actually, we have a, a blog post um, about CryptoLocker right now, if, if anybody needs a rehash of what I've talked about here. Great. Okay, well, what we're going to do, we're going to actually track that post down, and we're going to put a link to the direct post uh, in the show notes for episode number 317 here at Category5.tv. That way you can just get all the information that you need uh, to protect yourself from CryptoLocker. Again, Adam, always a pleasure. Thanks for being here, and uh, have a fantastic night. All right, you too. Thanks. Thanks. 
Category 5 TV is a production of Prodigy Digital Solutions and is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution 2.5 Canada. Thanks for watching.